Our scripture reading is in the Romans, and uh, it'll be on the screen, and you can follow along there, or you can uh, take out your pew Bible. If you're like me and you like to touch paper and uh, read the words right out of the scripture, uh, you can do that as well. And um, I'm seeing if the page number's here for us. I don't see the page number, I think, but you can find it. Fifth book of the Bible, chapter 14. And uh, verses 1 through 12. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Um, let, no one, uh, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another it is before his own master that he stands and falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Uh, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the honor of the Lord, since he gave thanks to God, while the one who abstains uh, also gives honor uh, of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself. You might underline that. That's a good one, if you have your Bible. Don't underline the pew Bible. <laughs> none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. The word of the Lord. Before we, uh, we look at the message, I just wanted to pray uh, with you. Um, we are going to uh, be praying uh, for the people of Hawaii. I'd like to play, pray for the Roden family. Uh, Brian's uncle, uh, Dan, passed away, and there'll be a service. Awake is Wednesday, and then a service, I believe, Thursday. Uh, but we want to pray for them. And so join me as we pray, also for the uh, people of Hawaii, of course. And uh, uh, we should be taking an offering in the coming weeks uh, for them. So uh, I'll keep you apprised of that. Our Father, we, we are glad to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, we're any Bible-believing Christian, uh, the body of Christ, where we are gathered around the world today. Uh, what a privilege that we can worship you in spirit and truth, and we thank you. I'd like to lift up uh, Brian and the Roden family uh, in the passing of uh, Brian's uncle Dan. We pray, uh, Lord, for your peace and comfort uh, during this week for the family. Um, we pray also for the, the people in Hawaii that have lost many children, and uh, I don't think they even know how many yet, how many people have passed. Um, but we lift up, um, especially Maui, um, praying for those folks, Lord. May, may they find your peace that passes all understanding. Uh, the Christian presence there, Lord, use them, we pray, to speak to the hearts of people through your spirit. Uh, we would pray now for our time in your word that uh, you would uh, encourage us today and uh, we pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. So my original title for this message was Accepting Others, uh, because uh, we've had a theme uh, as we've journeyed through uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14, uh, you know, dealing with relationships, a lot of talk about relationships, uh, relating to brothers and sisters in Christ, those in church, relating to authority. Uh, just relating to the world that we live in. Uh, we've talked a lot about this. And now as we move into chapter 14, there's a strong emphasis again on others, and then the rest of the chapter is going to deal in Christian liberty, uh, how, we, how we use our Christian uh, liberty to live. And I'll tell you what that means later on. Then in chapter 15, um, Paul's going to talk about how Jesus Christ is to be our example which makes sense if in chapter 14 you say, hey, you're supposed to live to the Lord, live for the Lord, live like the Lord. And then in chapter 15, he's going to talk about how we do that. And then uh, when we get uh, further into that chapter, he'll talk about his mission, 
uh, to bring the gospel to the world, and then a great benediction in chapter 16. So we're really coming rapidly now uh, to the conclusion of Romans, and then we'll be moving on to some other things. It's very important, however, as we look at this passage, that we know who Paul's writing to, who his audience is, and what he's really saying. So he's writing to the church. Everybody got that? This is not a letter to the world, right? He's writing to brothers and sisters in the church who are struggling over diets and days and other things that are causing division in the church at Rome. The reason I I stress uh, who he's writing to and what he's writing about And he's writing about um, ceremonial laws like diet and days. He is not writing about the moral law that we see in Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments and elsewhere. Very important we make that distinction because uh, there are pastors and others who have taken this passage of Scripture along with Matthew 7 where Jesus says, Judge not lest you be judged. You've heard that? How many have heard that? Judge not lest you be judged. All right. And they will use these verses to say essentially that any person in the world, in the church or out, doesn't matter. We can do whatever we want, and no one's allowed to judge what we do or say or think, right? You've heard that, right? Am I the only one? You've talked to people and say, hey, you can't judge anything I do, because the Bible says, judge not, lest you be judged. They're taking that out of context. Not only, uh, you know, we can't judge motive, you can't judge what people are thinking or what's in their heart, right? Right? You can't judge motive. And Paul's going to tell us that what people eat, and if they want to celebrate Christmas or Easter or not, that's their business. That's a ceremonial thing. You can't really judge that. However, when it comes to uh, someone committing adultery and they come to the pastor and say, gee, I'm having an affair. Is that okay? What do you think Pastor John's going to say? No, it's not okay because that's moral. That's a moral law problem. And uh, Old and New Covenant... It's not something we should be doing. And then, of course, the Bible says that we counsel people to do the right thing. So there's a time to judge, and there's a time not to judge. This chapter is talking about we don't judge people's motives, we don't judge what they eat, and what holy days they keep. That's essentially where we're going to go with this. I just want to make sure you're clear. There is a time to judge, but what's the, uh, what is the purpose of judging in the church if you have to? The book of James tells us it's restoration, not condemnation, restoration. So if someone is having an affair, you would counsel them with the word of God and have brothers and sisters come alongside of them, as we see in 1 Corinthians 5, and try to counsel them to do the right thing, and then restore them to fellowship. What, is that what usually happens? The answer is no. Often someone falls into sin and uh, we we reject them and despise them, which is what they were doing here over diet and days. Uh, And we don't try to uh, seek restoration and spiritual healing. Um, We are to do all we can to restore people uh, because we all fall short of the glory of God, right? We all stumble and sin. Can you imagine if every time we sinned we got thrown out of the church? There wouldn't be anybody in here. People at home, you should take note of that. We don't believe we're perfect, because we're not. Amen? All right, so let's move on. That's a long introduction, wasn't it? There's another part before the outline uh, that I should include. There's one other issue that kind of ties in with judging diets and and days, and that is uh, they were developing spiritual elitism. Essentially, they were saying, look, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm way more spiritual than those meat eaters over there. That guy went out and had a Big Mac. What a sinner. Oh, my goodness. And then the meat eaters were saying, those vegetarians, they're weak Christians. They're so weak they can't eat meat. They're weak because they don't eat meat. But we're more spiritual than they are. And it says in our text, they began to despise each other. The long and short of it, as we will see, is that we have a lot of freedom in Christ, a lot of liberty, And we'll find that out in in the coming uh, verses of chapter 14. We don't have a right to put someone down because of their diet or what days they celebrate or don't celebrate. And we don't want to make ourselves more spirits, think we're elitist and better. Last time I looked, the, the ground at the cross is level. 
You know what that means? The ground at the cross is level. <laughs> we're all in the same spot. We all have to go to the same cross and receive the same Jesus because we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. So you've got to try to keep all this in mind now as we go into this passage. So <laughs> good luck. I hope you can hang on to some things. All right. We're going to talk first about diet, verses 1 through 4, and then uh, days, verses 5 through 6, and then we're going to talk about brothers and others, verses 7 through 12. All right, well, let's look at, um, again, uh, starting with uh, verse 2, actually, uh, getting into, um, he says first in verse 1, don't quarrel over opinions, you got that? Uh, one person believes he may eat anything. That would be Pastor John. I eat anything, except for those little um, creamed onions that are, bo- you know, those little tiny, I think my dad called them pearl onions. I don't know, I just don't like them. Any other vegetable, I'm good, but I just don't like, I don't know, they don't taste right, feel right. But I'll eat anything else, pretty much. Now, I watch the show alone. Some of you watch that. I'm not going to eat some of the stuff they eat. I'm just talking about normal food. I love all the vegetables and fish, meat, whatever. So he says, look, one person believes he can eat anything, while someone else believes that you should only eat vegetables, right? We see that? And uh, he says, don't despise the person because they only eat vegetables or someone who eats meat and so on. Now, in the book of Acts, I think it's a good um, cross-reference in chapter 10, uh, the apostle Peter has a vision. Uh, he, he was hungry, he hadn't eaten, he falls into a trance. He has a vision, and in the vision, uh, a large tablecloth, that's what I would call it, comes down from heaven, and there's all kinds of things to eat on there, all kinds of animals, but they weren't kosher, right? And so he sees all these animals and things to eat, and, and he hears a voice from heaven, Peter, go forth, kill and eat. And he was hungry after all. But Peter says, Lord, I can't eat that stuff. I've never had bacon. There's a pig on that. I can't eat pork. He says, I've never defiled myself. I've kept the ceremonial, the laws about diet my whole life. And so then during the vision, the voice says, look, what I have made clean is clean. Right? And what what the vision was saying, similar to what Jesus had told some of the Pharisees in the gospel, is that the ceremonial laws are over, and now, Peter, you can eat these things. I told the first service, I wonder what it was like the first morning where Peter had bacon and eggs. They laughed in the first service. How many of you like bacon? I love the smell. I don't eat it a lot, right? And sometimes my wife gives me turkey bacon, but frankly, it's just not the same. Amen? Can you imagine Peter the first time going to a local restaurant and having a strip of bacon? Wow. Freedom in Christ. I can have bacon now. I wonder if he kept eating it. I don't know. We don't know. I'm just trying to think through the text with you, right? It doesn't say if he ever ate bacon. I don't know. But what we have here in Acts and in Romans 14 is a declaration from God that the dietary laws of the Old Covenant... You and I don't have to follow them. But remember, this letter is written to a church in Rome made up of a lot of Jewish people because the early church started out of Judaism, right? That's why we call it the uh, Judeo-Christian ethics and all that. Judaism and Christianity are linked together. And so the early church had a lot of Jewish folks, and they were struggling now with the new covenant, being told that the ceremonial laws don't have to be followed. You can have lobster and shrimp now. You can have fried clams. Amen. They didn't eat that stuff. And now they're being told they can. So you can understand the struggle, I think, if we put it in that sense. Peter's told what used to be unclean is now clean. But we also find uh, during his diet struggle that Paul's other concern He's not only trying to tell them that they don't have to worry about that, but he says they were, there was quarreling and, and fighting over the opinions about what to eat. 
Again, verse 3, let not the one who eats despise the one. Isn't despise a strong word? Do you despise anybody? That's a tough word, isn't it? I don't want to despise someone. That's a strong word. That, that's right up there with hate to me. Despise. I despise you? That's terrible. He says, don't despise someone over food. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? And what he's saying there is, this person's a servant of Jesus Christ, just like you're supposed to be. So why are you despising him based on what he eats or she eats? He's trying to show them how absurd that is. It's not something that the church should do. Because that person stands or falls and will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. They're in God's hands. They want to eat a Big Mac and fries, then they're allowed to do that. They're really tasty, by the way. I have to, have to stay away from those. But once in a while, pretty good stuff. Now Paul touches on this again in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians because the Corinthian church was having the same argument over diet. And, and their problem was, um, you know, meat was expensive. It's getting pretty expensive around here too. I heard Massachusetts, they're enforcing a new law about pork. Are you familiar with that? Mark shaking his head. He's heard about it. I read about it and I didn't even know it was going to be a thing. But they regulate the pork that comes into the state and the pork from the state um, to make sure that the pork farms, the pig farms, have certain humane standards for the pigs. Or, I don't know, something like that. And so they said there might be a slight increase in the price of pork because of this new regulation. Well, of course, that's how it works. In the Adirondacks where we live, um, a, a pound of bacon is usually about 12 bucks where our house in Wells is but I still buy it once in a while. <laughs> but they would go, their problem was they would go to the local meat market and it was too expensive, so then they would go over to the pagan temple and they would buy meat that had been offered to an idol because it was cheaper. And so in 1 Corinthians 8, that becomes the argument. Wait a minute now, if you're a Christian, how can you eat meat that's been offered to an idol? Maybe a legitimate question, right? Their response, and what Paul said, look, idols are nothing. They're not real. Now, the meat's real, but the idols are fake. So it really doesn't make any difference if you buy your meat at the meat market or at the temple to save money. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So they had a big division over that, which leads to division over days, right? Verses 5 and 6. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days the same or alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gave thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, who gives thanks to God, and so on. Many years ago, um, I went to Florida, and I did a wedding for my, my niece, and uh, after they'd been married, um, I think we did the wedding in August. It was hot down there. I don't like going to Florida in the summer. Really hot. So anyway, uh, about late November, early December, I got a call from my niece. And she said, uh, as we're establishing our new Christian household, Uncle John, is it okay to have a Christmas tree? They said someone had told them that a Christmas tree is an idol, and that Christians should not have a Christmas tree. Has anyone ever heard that before? I hadn't. That was the first. So I, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah talks about this. He talks about how someone will go out to the forest, they'll cut down a tree, and they'll chop the wood up for their fire so they can heat their home and cook their food. Have you read that in Jeremiah? And then somebody else will make an idol, a statue, out of the same tree that they're burning to keep warm, and somehow they think that piece of wood is an idol, and they pray to it. And Jeremiah goes on to talk about how silly that is, that you would think that the tree you cut down, if you make part of it into an image or something, it, it can do stuff for you. But I said to my niece who asked me, can you, can you, 
can you have a Christmas tree? I said, are you going to pray to your Christmas tree? We sing that song, oh, Christmas tree, oh, we're not praying, you know. I said, are you going to pray to the tree? She said, of course not. I said, are you going to bow down and worship the Christmas tree? She said, no. I said, well, then get a Christmas tree. If you're not going to worship it, it's just a symbol that Martin Luther actually started that back in Germany a long time ago. They were having trouble not only on diet, but days. Some, some of the Christians in Rome apparently were celebrating some of the old ceremonial days of the Old Testament, like the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Trumpets or keeping the Sabbath, because they were struggling with not celebrating those days anymore. And so Paul not only addresses it here, but in Colossians chapter 2, we have to move on quickly here, in chapter 2 of Colossians, he says, let no one pass judgment in questions of food or drink or with regard to festivals, new moons, feasts, or Sabbath days. They are a shadow of what's to come, which was Christ. So they were from the old covenant, the old ceremonial laws. Now that we have Christ, you don't have to celebrate those festivals unless you want to. That's all. Everybody gets that, right? Uh, I, I know some Christians. I was reading, in fact, Tony Evans' commentary of Romans, and uh, he said when he got married, his wife's parents did not celebrate Christmas. Now, Dr. Evans and his wife, all through their family life together, she passed away, sadly, a year ago, but they always celebrated Chris Christmas, and the father-in-law never like, gave him a hard time about it. He said, that's your choice, right? But the father-in-law didn't celebrate Christmas because he felt... It's been so commercialized, he just didn't want anything to do with it. So that's the kind of thing that Paul's talking about here. If someone wants to celebrate those days, let them. If someone else doesn't want to, that's fine too. But certainly don't despise your brother. Look at verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or despise your brother? Over days, right? Over what holidays they celebrate. So there's a deeper message here. I think in the modern days, I don't think we really worry about. Like when you join our church, we don't, in the, in the membership class, we don't ask what you eat, right? <laughs> Whether you go to Burger King or McDonald's, is it? We probably require everybody to go to Burger King, right? But we don't, we don't do that stuff. We don't ask you if you celebrate Christmas or not. You get to choose that. We just had a nice experiment for the summer. It went okay. You know, we were trying to work on some things. And, and as usual, we know that there are differing opinions in our church over worship styles and music. I still think we can work something out eventually. I know a lot of people would like to just have one service, right? So we're working on that, just so you know. But it's, it's really the same kind of thing. God receives our worship, whether it's contemporary or traditional. He really does. I have no idea what worship in heaven is going to be like. I think we'll all be surprised. I have no idea. It really comes down to the attitude of the heart, doesn't it? We come to worship God in spirit and truth, and some prefer contemporary music when they do that, some traditional. But when a push comes to shove, when we all stand before God, it doesn't really matter. I remember my mom, um, when she moved to Florida, all the churches were contemporary, all these little churches with three, 4,000 people. Because in Pensacola, where she moved, all the churches are really ginormous. They're really big. And she finally, she finally went to a church. She said, I, I don't really like the music, but the Bible says I need to go to church, right? So I'm going to go to church, even though I, I would prefer hymns over contemporary. So I told that story in the first service, and, and during coffee, my wife came up to me, and she said, yeah, but remember, Mom turned off her hearing aids during the worship. <laughs> so she went, <laughs> but she would turn off her hearing aid. It's kind of funny. Um, so mom, you know, she's up in heaven. I don't know what's going on up there. Um, anyway, let's just briefly talk about verses 7 through 12 so we can get to the Lord's table here. Again, Paul says that ultimately here's the point. He says, we live not for ourselves, verse 7 and 8. We live to God. We're supposed to be living for God, for Jesus. Amen? That's who we live for. 
So who or what are we living for as the body of Christ? Why do we come to church? You know, it, we do have social connections, and that's good. We want to build relationship and have discipleship and Bible study and all these things. But our first priority is that we're living for Him, and we belong to Him. Amen? And so there's going to be some bumps along the way, like there was in Rome. I'm sure they figured this all out, what they did and what they didn't do, who ate what, what days they kept, and so on. Psalm 24, verse 1 says that um, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the fullness thereof, the world, and all those who dwell therein, all the people. Verse 10, again, we will all be judged by God. Uh, So he says, don't despise or judge others over ceremonial laws or personal preferences and opinions. So we have to be careful because we can quarrel over non-essentials. And that was the problem they were having there. So, just want to make one last clarification before we uh, close this in prayer and and have the Lord's table. Um, Again, I I originally entitled this Accepting Others. That was the title. And then I went to Diets and Days, and I think Tony Evans might use that. But then I thought, you know, a really good title for this passage. You ready for this? It's a little long, that's the problem. Learning to accept the different preferences and traditions of others in the church. And next week I'll ask you, what was the title? You'll remember diets and days. I don't think you'll remember learning to accept the different preferences and traditions of others in the church. Just too long. So Tony Evans says this, and I'll close with this. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week anyway. This is certainly a time to judge. Moral issues, we, we have to, as a church, judge and address those. But regardless of, of what we're judging, this is what Tony Evans wrote, and I think it's, it's apt. He says, there are two ways to judge others. There's critically or charitably. Right? Critically or charitably to hurt or to help them. And what do you think the Bible wants us to do? Help. Help people. He says, personal preferences and opinions should not divide the church. So I think he's right. Um, but we can have strong opinions. That's certainly fine. And we'll, we'll figure it all out. Right? First parish, we're going to work on some things. But uh, God bless you for your efforts. And uh, I love everybody in our church. And uh, I think we have, we're going the right way. Let's put it that way. We're moving forward. Looking forward to Wednesday nights this fall. And... Um, We'll be looking at the book of Galatians. That's one option that will be given. I'll be teaching that. Hoping to have a couple other classes. But uh, believe it or not, Galatians addresses some of these same issues. So uh, let's just bow in prayer, and then we're going to share the Lord's table together. Our Father, we thank you uh, for your word today. And uh, there's a lot to chew on, and we're grateful for that. And uh, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts, uh, whatever it is that you have for us. We're so grateful for the Spirit of God who lives within us to guide and direct our steps. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.